Personal notice changes my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you get a job from me, George Valentine. Write full details. Standard Oil Company of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Ugly Duckling, another adventure of George Valentine. My dear Mr. Valentine... Having devoted my entire life to music, to the management of concerts, the development of singers, I find that sometimes my knowledge of simple human nature is uh, lacking. A friend of mine needs help, quite desperately. A woman who gave up her own musical career just for the sake of a man who is as cold and bleak, as incapable of tenderness as the music he composes of the dreary stone house that they hibernate in. His name is Edmund Salter. He is very ill, it's true. But caring for him has made his wife even more than ill. She can't even smile anymore. Nor will she tell me, her oldest and only remaining friend, the strange secret of her unhappiness, her worry, her fear, perhaps even her danger. Mr. Valentine, since I must leave shortly for New York, the opening of a new ballet, will you please, please come immediately to meet me at the Salter's home? It is far out on Ocean Drive, Pacific Bluffs, California. Sincerely, Yasha Hardwick. Come on, George, he won't mind. He? I'm just beginning to wake up. It's the husband playing Edmund Salter, it must be. Mr. Hardwick said composer, and it never occurred to me, but there was an Edmund Salter who was famous. Well, you couldn't prove it by me. Concert pianist? Mm -hmm. When I was in school, he performed once. But there's something strange about him. He's a little tiny man, George. He makes a lot of big music. He was... He was shy, and... Well, he's the one they call the Ugly Duckling. Well... Oh. How do you do? Oh, excuse us. We were just listening to... Uh... I have absolutely no statement to make for the papers. And if you think you're going to hear a personal or private requiem... Oh, well, just a minute. My name is George Valentine. This is Miss Brooks... You're Mrs. Salter, aren't you? The friends of Yasha Hardwick in town? Yes, that's right. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> he has such odd friends, I never would have guessed. Well, I... Oh, I'm one of the oddest. Don't be offended. Yasha's staying at the hotel, but he's on his way over now, I think. You may wait for him here. Uh, Mrs. Salter, is, uh, is that one of your husband's own pieces he's playing? Johann Sebastian Bach. Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't know. I just... Uh... Johann Sebastian Bach. Lovely, isn't it? Edmund plays it so neatly, so cleanly, so precisely. Alongside of my husband's own music, you know, Bach sounds like Chopin, like the springtime, like, like Boogie Woogie. What's that? Like something with blood in it, Mr. Valentine. I'm afraid my husband was much too self-centered to be ever quite capable of, of... What's the matter, Mrs. Salter? Oh, pardon me. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo, Mary! Mary, darling, may we come in? Of course you may. Hello, Bertha. And you, too? Oh, this is Emil, darling, my new husband I told you about. Mrs. Salter. Well, you get such handsome husbands, don't you, Bella? What does she say? Oh, nothing, dear. Mary, darling, I rush back. These are friends of Yasha's, Bella. Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Oh. Mrs. Bella Rappo, Emil Rappo. Oh, hello. How do you do? Such a pleasure. Emil Rappo. You're a pianist, too, aren't you? In this house? No, 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 no. Alongside of Edmund Salter, I would call myself a, a bricklayer. Oh, he's so modest, too, and polite. And such a friendly smile. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Salter... Oh, Mary, darling, I understand how upset you are. I rushed back from San Francisco just the moment I heard. But if only I hadn't left here yesterday, it was such a tragic surprise. Yes, you rushed back. Of course you rushed back. And I'm so glad that you did, Bella. I've been just waiting for you. I've been just waiting to slap your face. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Mary, darling. What in the name of... Why, why on earth did she do that? Why? To hit you. I don't know, lady, but it seems... Oh, no, no, please, both of you. The poor thing must be almost out of her mind. After all, she's devoted her entire life to him. 
Well, won't one of you please go in there and shut off that phonograph? Phonograph? It's just George. making it... It's making it worse for her. It sounds so real. Well, I, I will shut off the phonograph. Oh, I should have guessed an angel. Yes. It happened late last night. She wired me. He had another attack. Edmund Salter. The ugly duckling is finally dead. <laughs> Since moving here, Mrs. Salter seems to have changed so, Valentine. In the old days, she used to be alive and warm and so... And now cool. she's a nervous wreck. Sure, Hardwick, I'll buy that. But what exactly... Well, Mr. Valentine, her husband, Edmund Salter, he was cold, aloof. The sort of man who would keep things to himself. Go on. I strongly suspect there was some specific thing, some secret of his that might bear on the way she is. If you could only find it. Perhaps in some of his papers. There is a box of them somewhere, I'm sure. And it will be easier now that he is dead. Yeah, yeah, now that he's dead. And Salter died of his illness, of course. Another attack. I, uh, I haven't talked to the doctor about No, him. neither have I. But the doctor's name is Robinson. Miss Brooks is getting in touch with him for I, me. You're curious? Well, wouldn't you be? Haven't you noticed all the bottles and medicines in this house? Well, of course. And a good many of them with red labels? Drugs? Maybe poison? Mr. Valentine, I asked you here to Pacific Bluffs because I was afraid for Mary Salter. She had the foolishness to devote her life to a man incapable of love. A selfish man, a man she may have feared for some reason, but... No, I, I can't imagine she ever grew really to, to, to hate him. I didn't say that. Oh. I didn't say anything. Now, this is quite a place they have here. Worth a good deal, I imagine. Oh, he was wealthy, yes, if that's what you mean. He made it on concert, invested wisely, I suppose. Why? Why, now that Edmund Salter is already dead, do you still want me to go nosing around for what was wrong between him and his wife? Well, Could I... Could it have been money? Mrs. Salter's career was never very successful, was it? You've managed them both. Who gets his money now, Mr. Hardwick? Well, really, Mr. Valentine, I haven't the slightest... I notion. can answer that. Mrs. Rappo. I get some of it. You do? Twenty-five or thirty thousand, I suppose. Thirty thousand? Well, there's uh, nothing to be surprised about. I started Edmund Salter on his career, you know. Loaned money for his studies, his first concerts. You see, there, there was a day when I had money to give to musicians. There's a vicarious thrill in being a patroness of the arts. <laughs> it's true, Mr. Valentine. Mrs. Rappo has started a great many young people. And I doubt if the ugly duckling ever pays her back. He certainly did. The tables are reversed, that's all. He knew that I needed help now. And so does that pupil of his. Pupil? Yes. Miss Diana Luskin, her name is. She lives in your town, Mr. Valentine. A great deal of promise, I've heard. But no career's worth much unless you have a little money to start out on. Yeah, I see. Salter was planning to give her some, too. And what about the rest of it? The rest, Mr. Valentine? To his wife, naturally. All the rest. The house, everything. To Mary, of course. That's what I've always understood. Where else would it go? What else was there in Edmund's life besides music and... and his wife? George! Hold me! George! <laughs> None of your business. None of your business. I found her burning things in here, George. I didn't mean to interrupt, but the door was open and she was so startled, screamed at me to get out. Some sheets of music. That's all that's left. Well, that's all there was. No, it isn't. Those other papers weren't music. But it's my house. I can do what I like. A little fire might warm this house up. Yeah, sure, of course you can, Mrs. Salter. But you just found this stuff, didn't you? It was in the box there. Your husband's name on it. My husband's dead. It's my estate now. I can do what I like. Now I can do anything I like. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, operator, long distance. It's a city number, I'll wait. Yes, sir. George, what are you doing? Miss Diana Luskin. What? <laughs> Curiosity's getting me, Angel. Say, tell me, Dr. Robinson, isn't it quite possible that Edmund Salter could have been given an overdose of a wrong or a wrong dose of medicine that somebody could have wanted him to die? No. Oh, wanted. 
Well, yes, yes. Maybe I I don't know about that. But uh, did it actually happen? No. But Dr. Robinson... I was with Edmund Salter for the last 12 hours of his life. What? There is absolutely no conceivable possibility that the man died from anything other than natural causes. Oh, I see. Your party doesn't answer, sir. Hmm. Oh, what's that, operator? I said, I'm sorry, sir, but I have the correct number now, and your party doesn't seem to answer. Oh. Brooks, see, maybe we're just trying to open some hidden boxes in private lives that shouldn't be open. Shall I try again later, sir? Hmm. Uh, no, no thanks, operator. Might as well cancel the... Hello. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, but never mind. Hey, look, say hello again, will you? Valentine, what in the name Lieutenant of... Lieutenant Johnson, I was calling Diana Luskin. What are you doing there? You can't talk to her. She's busy. I'm busy watching the rescue squad. Bring her around. What do you think? Bring her around? Oh, the young lady drank a little too much wine, that's all. Out of a little gift bottle sent to her yesterday from up where you are, Pacific Bluffs. And what do you think was in that wine, Valentine? Poison. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. A squeak or a rattle in the family car is annoying, to say the least. But even worse, it's a sure sign that something could be wearing out. And 60% of all auto repair bills could be avoided if drivers remembered one simple rule. Chassis lubrication at regular intervals. That's how the protective service offered you by standard stations and by independent Chevron gas stations can save you a lot of money. Ask them for their expert lubrication job every thousand miles. It's one of the surest ways to keep your car out of the repair shop. For here, they're specially trained to catch every single wear spot. And they use over a dozen RPM lubricants, each one tailor-made to do an important wear-saving job. It's a protective service that not only assures longer car life, but a smoother, cushioned ride free of squeaks and rattle. Ask for it every thousand miles at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. The ugly duckling is dead. A strange, cold man, once a concert pianist, and then a composer of perfect, concise, cold music, Edmund Salter, is dead. The doctor insists his death was quite natural. But there's nothing natural about any of the little group of people collected in the lonesome stone house overlooking the ocean near Pacific Bluffs. And so if your name is George Valentine, it's no great surprise when you learn that a distant beneficiary of Salter's will, Diana Luskin, was made ill by a gift bottle sent from Pacific Bluffs, by a drug, a poison, which you very soon confirm could only have come from this very same house, some of Salter's medicine. Here, George. This is the room we caught Mr. Salter bringing those things in. The sewing room, huh? Yeah, I guess so. There's the little box of her husband she took the papers out of, yeah. whatever they were. I don't know what I expect to find, Angel. The doctor's already rounded up all the medicine bottles for fingerprinting. It's ashes, that's all. Uh-huh. And this folder of music is the only thing left. Manuscript paper. Something he wrote himself. All we've got left to tell us the story of the ugly duckling. Hmm. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> He's out of your dum, class, George, here. Let me try... I don't know. I thought you said everybody was downstairs. Well, I... In here, I think. The next room is the study or the library. Yeah. Oh, empty. Sounded like something metal. Yeah. The porcelain stove there, maybe. Only whoever it was... George! Oh, well, now, look who's here. Oh, 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 oh Mr. Valentine. <laughs> oh, I didn't know it was you, honestly, I... I just heard someone come. Yeah. What were you doing, tinkering with the stove, Mr. Hardwick? Prying around? George, at least he wasn't burning anything. The grate's cold. No, no, of course. I'm just curious, like you are, Mr. Valentine. I can't stand not knowing. Not knowing what? 
That's just it. That's what I hired you to find out. You didn't find anything destroyed in here? No, not after your experience. I thought perhaps poor Mary has had to destroy many things recently. Or has thought she had to. But there was nothing in the ashes there except these two little loops of ribbon. Yeah, let me see. Hmm. It must have been pink ribbon. Silver threads kept them from burning completely. Yeah, and burned some time ago. Now, wait a minute. Here. Corner of a newspaper caught on the lid, see? Last week's newspaper. Pink ribbon. It's tinsely and dainty. Not exactly Mary Salter's style, is it? Well, nor her husband's, the ugly duckling. So I doubt if my discovery amounts to much. Mr. Hardwick, do you remember what happened to the ugly duckling in the fairy tale? What? Come on, Angel. Bring that music. The duckling turned into a swan, Mr. Hardwick. A swan. Well, of course, I can play this, Mr. Valentine, but Salter should have wanted it buried. <laughs> he will probably turn in his grave. Shall I leave this door open, too, George? Yeah, that's right, Brooksy. Mrs. Salter still in the back parlor? Uh-huh. I bet she doesn't stay there long. Oh, don't worry. She'll hear it all right. You know, whatever this thing is, it's tied up one way or another with the papers we know she did burn. There, you see, it is soupy, too much sentimentality. Keep it up, you're doing fine. The one thing Edmund Salter always had was dignity. Calm, concise clarity. To call for the common ear, but musicians' music. Never mind the lecture, Mac. Hey, Brooksy, look. Yeah, here she comes. It's a magnet, all right. Hey, Bill. What on earth? Hello, my pet. How do you like this, this hot fudge Sunday? <laughs> what is it? What? Come on, keep playing. It's a new work of Edmund Salter's, Mrs. Rappel. What? Oh, no. Oh, yes. What the man says is true, my pet. Poor fellow, he would die all over again if he could know anyone was hearing it. Let me see the pages. Mrs. Rappel, I'm sorry, but I want him to keep playing. Did you, did you look through the pages? Here, I can take the back one. No, no, I, I don't read music that well, but will you... That's not what I mean. It's program notes. What? On the back of the pages. Edmund always typed his own program notes. That he insisted yeah, on. Yeah, let me see. I can read it. To whom it may concern, it is my absolute wish that the accompanying work be performed by a pianist of the first rank, preferably in Carnegie Hall. Oh, the poor idiot. While I realize that it is a departure from my usual technique, I consider this work my most personal composition. There are some loose leaf notes attached in explanation, or perhaps confession. Loose leaf notes? George, maybe those were what she burned. Yeah, yeah, go on, Mrs. Rappel. Confession. I call this work The Secret Sonata, and I dedicate it to the two secret loves of. Hey, Mrs. Oh. Rappel, wait. Don't tear that up. Give it to me, will you? Stop it. Stop it all. Yes, and you. Stop saying that. Stop every mushy, feeble-minded note. Mary. Mrs. Soldier, what in the and name you, of... And you, Bella, sonata to the two secret loves of... Mary! Why do you stay here? I slapped your face once. I've insulted your husband. I've... Mary, Tra please. Amy, you'll go on playing. Please, please. But so fast you talk, I do not understand. You heard the lady buster. Play it. Here, have some more music. Stay here with them, Brooksy. Well, it's only a waste of time for any You're of you. You're coming with me, ladies, both of you. Yeah, that's better. Well, let's leave the husband out of this. Mr. Valentine... I want you to clearly understand. For years, I was a patroness of music. I was a patroness of Mr. Edmund Salter. That is absolutely all. All in the music. For Carnegie Hall. For the world to hear. I sacrificed my own career, my entire life for that man. Mary! You know the secret now, Mr. Valentine. My jealousy. My... my husband's infidelity. I'm sure there's nothing more you need to know. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Salter, but the other half of the sonata... The other of two loves. A young woman who was sent some poison from this house. While you were in there, a policeman came to the house. He says his name is Lieutenant Johnson and he wants to see you. You bet he does, lady. I'm trying to tell you, there's still a little matter of attempted murder. Oh, 
Oh, but Johnson, for the love of Pete... You heard me, Valentine. There's no case. Oh, but Diana Luskin was male poison. That's attempted murder. That's... They bottled their own wine in this house. Sure, some drug got into it by mistake, but not enough to kill a mouse. What? All I knew was she was sick from the stuff. Well, the office had a message waiting for me at the local police. But I know now there's only one person who could have sent that stuff to her. Sure, sure. Mrs. Salter herself. She's the one sent the poison, all right. A, a vindictive gesture. Vindictive gesture? That's what it'll be called. What else could we ever prove? Oh, so that's it. Mrs. Salter was the one who always gave that medicine to her husband. She'd have known how much to use for a lethal dose, wouldn't she? And there's the case right there. Uh-huh. The most important thing is Miss Luskin herself refuses to bring charges of any kind. She says it must have been a mistake, too. We can't make a case without her help. She's already in touch with Salter's lawyer, and he came down here just behind her. Yeah. <laughs> so Mrs. Salter was just a jealous woman who was married to a two-timing heel. And the other two women involved are so afraid for their reputations, or maybe I should say a musical career for one and a new husband, Emil Rappel, for the other, that they'll do anything to keep it quiet, too. That's about it. Johnson, I best go and offer my apologies to the lady of the house. Mrs. Sauter, what did you burn this time? The pages of the sonata that were still there on the piano? Pages of it? What do you mean? Uh, what did the lawyer say about burning the sonata? About going against your husband's wishes? Uh, they... Well, I, I did it before they came. <laughs> they thought it was in the best interest of my husband's memory. Yeah, the stony, cold little guy on top of the musical pedestal. I devoted my life to him, Mr. Valentine. I never once suspected. Toward me, he was always, well, incapable of tenderness and... Sentiment. Why don't you cut it out? What? Tell me something, Mrs. Salter. What was the rest of the deal to hush it up? With the lawyers and Mrs. Bella Rappo? And maybe they've talked again to Miss Luskin on the phone. I don't know what you mean. I've already talked to Mrs. Rappo myself. She's not inheriting 30000 anymore, is she? And the girl isn't taking hers either, is she? Not if there's a scandal to go with it. Oh? Mrs. Well? Rappo's got her husband a meal to think about. And I suppose the girl thinks too much of the memory of your husband or too much of her own career. They'll both refuse that money. Mr. Valentine. That was the uh, price you asked for burning the sonata, wasn't it? The price for interfering with your husband's supposed desire to have that thing performed at Carnegie. To air some bad music and nasty program notes like the family wash in public. Well, I tried to burn it before. I didn't want it to happen. Oh, yes, way. yes. It happened just the way you planned it, lady. There'll be no concert and you'll get all the money. Yeah, pretty neat. Except that it's not going to work. Simply because of your bad timing. Bad timing? You said you tried to burn the music before. Well, then, Mrs. Sauter, why didn't you? When Miss Brooks caught you at it the first time, why did you leave your door open? And how did Yasha Hardwick know there was a secret box somewhere unless you told him about it? And if you knew, then why hadn't you already looked into it? Your husband was an invalid. Yes, why didn't you burn the sonata days ago? Mr. I'll Valentine. tell you why, lady. It's because you wanted the big secret to be uncovered just the way it was today. Oh, I know none of what I've said is concrete, but this is. Where did you get that? Just one page from that sonata, but it's all I need. I stuck it in my pocket on a hunch, and the hunch is right, isn't it? Give me that. Give it to me. Oh, no. This is what I'll take to his publisher, who can examine his musical figures the same way a handwriting expert examines a forgery. No, no. Give it to me, please. Let me have it. Let me have it. No. Because that's it, isn't it, lady? It was you who made up the whole nasty thing about some very nice people. And I don't know why I didn't realize when I heard what bad music this was. Because he didn't write the sonata. That was your fraud, Mrs. Salter. You wrote it. There's still nothing you can do, Mr. Valentine. Even if I did write it. No. So long as you don't interfere with salt as well. Oh, how can I now? It was such a joke, that sonata. Making people believe that he could be sentimental. Capable of tenderness. Mrs. Salter, I guess there isn't any way you can be punished. Except maybe one. You see, there's one thing I've left out. A couple of pink ribbons. They'd been burned in the stove in your husband's study a week ago. I showed them to Mrs. Rappo. She said they'd been tied around the letters he wrote to her, which she'd returned later on. What? But he never wrote to her. 
They were just friends. He was incapable of... I suppose he burned those letters himself so as not to hurt you by finding them after he died. (laughs) Funny, isn't it? The little guy must have been considerate and kind and lots of good things. And the only punishment I can think for you, Mrs. Salter, is to tell you the real truth. Your husband did love Bella Rappo, and probably the girl, too. No, no, you're mistaken. But not in a way that you can understand. He loved them from a distance, because they were all he had. Bella said he once wrote her that he wanted to give you so much happiness, that his tragedy was in marrying a woman incapable of tenderness. Valentine, what'd you tell that Salter dame anyway? Well, when she said goodbye to me, she looked like she'd seen a ghost. Did she? Well, I'm afraid Mrs. Salter's just beginning to realize how badly she wasted her life. What do you mean by that, George? Oh, well, nothing, I guess. But maybe it made me think about things a little. Huh? Oh, you know, thinking about... Well, thinking about the Pacific Bluffs here. It's a beautiful place to live in. Or, for that matter, to visit or to take a vacation in, or to go on your honeymoon. Yes, George. Go on. Oh, 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 what am I doing, getting sentimental? I've been out of my league, that's all. Uh, I wonder if there's any place around here we could catch some good Dixieland music. drives the kids to school in stormy weather? Who uses the car to do the family shopping and other errands around town? In a lot of families, these are equally shared duties. And if you want to be extra nice to the person who's going to use the car next, let me give you a tip. Before you put the car away, make sure there's plenty of Chevron Supreme gasoline in the tank. This premium quality gasoline is climate tailored. It's specially blended for each season of the year, based on weather reports from your driving area. Further, it's tailored to each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. That's why Chevron Supreme makes all your short trip driving more pleasant, for it gives your car faster starts, smoother pickup in traffic, ping-free power on hills. You'll find you can't buy a better gasoline for today's high-compression engines. Try Chevron Supreme tomorrow. Get it at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard Oil Company of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Virginia Gregg appeared as Brooksy. Ken Christie was heard as Lieutenant Johnson, Larry Dobkin as Hardwick, Irene Tedrow as Mary, Lee Patrick as Bella, Jay Novello as Emile, and Victor Rodman as Robinson. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. (laughs) 